This is a quote from Thich Nhat Hanh, who's a Vietnamese Zen master. As long as our ancestors are still suffering within us, we cannot be truly happy. If we make a step with awareness, we do this for all the past and future generations. They all arrive at the same moment we arrive, and we all find peace at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, usually I have a more cerebral and intellectual approach to things, but in this work I haven't done it that way. I've just been immersed in it, and I still haven't read much about it, really. But this is a very good book, uh, Love's Hidden Symmetry by Bert Hellinger, who's the founder constellation work. He started out life as a priest mm -hmm. in Germany and um, spent 20-25 years working in South Africa with the Zulu and became very immersed in their uh, culture, learned the language, and I think was deeply affected in his later thinking by their worldview. I, I I see a lot of his ways of thinking as what I would call shamanic. Um, and, and a deep, you know, there's a deep uh, understanding of the impact of the, of the ancestors. So, in all shamanism all over the world, no matter where it is, the Amazon or, you know, our, our Native American traditions in this country or in Siberia or wherever, um, there's this deep respect for the ancestors and an understanding that current problems could well be related to unresolved issues in the ancestral lineage. And an example that I'll just make up, and I mean, it's the kind of thing you would read if you read these books, is that, um, say your wife is now infertile, infertile, can't have a baby, can't get pregnant. So you go to a traditional healer and uh, they do it diagnosis called a divination by whatever, by a variety of different means and the diagnosis might indicate that your grandfather did not correctly perform the water ritual at the right time. So that then is fixed by an intervention that the shaman creates. So, I mean, in our Western way of thinking, that doesn't seem like the most effective way to deal with infertility, but it can be, and it often is. Um, Margot had an experience with a traditional shaman, and it was very powerful, very helpful. Um, and anyway, it's, it's just a worldview that I think is shot through Hellinger's work. So, I mentioned it right at the beginning, because I think it's important to get the roots of this, and I think the roots of it are his time with Azula. That's my view. But um, and he's embraced shamanism and shamanic practitioners throughout his whole career. He's co-written books with them. Um, it's it's not like this is a big secret. So um, he he had, uh, eventually he left the priesthood, got married to a woman who's a former nun. Uh, they were married some time, period of time, fairly long. He gradually, he spent maybe, it seems like five or six years at least in the U.S. in the 70s. Uh, had a long experience with primal therapy and many family systems um, kinds of treatment. Um, and all of those things I had deep experience with also in the seven, mid-70s. Um, <clears throat> so I know something about what he, what he experienced, but uh, he was very affected by some of the family systems therapists at that time, Virginia Satir as an example, or Carl Whitaker, or some of, um, so there, there are many, but uh, Ivan Borzomeny Nash, these were all well-known um, psychologists and social workers and psychiatrists who were writing from the perspective of the family as the unit that needed to be intervened. Uh, and, and in a very nutshell kind of way, um, fam that family therapy approach would say, take a problem of a teenage boy who has been, say, had a psychotic episode, and 
they would see that boy as the young man as the identified patient, but not that the problem is his. That he is a carrier or a representative uh, for this problem in the family system. So they would call him the identified patient. So, but it would be understood that the family unit was the problem. Something was not clicking in the family. And so they would try to intervene uh, and take the emphasis off the, the person who was sort of presented as the patient and work with the family system. So that was uh, a widely used and very interesting approach that was developed you know, in this country primarily, also probably England and, um, in the 70s, uh, and he was exposed to this. So he took the, these experiences, the shamanism, the primal therapy, the family therapy, the systems therapy approaches, and he uh, built on that and created his own approach, um, which he calls, I guess, systemic constellation or family constellation work. Is that a fair? Is that, um, much of this you can glean from reading his Wikipedia page. Uh, it's, it's pretty comprehensive. Um, but anyway, this book came out in '98, and I think it's a good it's a good summary of how his thinking was at that time. Um, so I just bookmarked a few things. There's a this, a lot of this is uh, dialogue that's been transcribed and uh, at workshops and one questioner says essentially, you know, Hellinger routinely re re received a lot of um, hostility, especially from traditional therapists, because his way of thinking was so out of the box, um, and he dealt with very powerful and disruptive situations. Uh, so this man's asking, how do you maintain inner tranquility in spite of the heavy situations that you are in and the hostile confrontations by people in the audience that sometimes arise? And I thought his answer was really interesting. Tranquility and clarity of perception are made possible by consenting to the world as it is without any intention to change it. That's fundamentally a religious attitude because it aligns me with a greater whole without separating me from it. I don't pretend to know better or hope to achieve something better than what the inner forces already at work in the system would do by themselves. When I see something terrible, that too is an aspect of the world and I consent to it. When I see something beautiful, I consent to that also. I call this attitude humility consenting to the world as it is. Only this consent makes perception possible. Without it, wishes, fears, judgments, my constructs interfere with my perception. So very similar to things we've talked about in here forever, right? Seeing things as they are and accepting them because that's how they actually are. And you know, what I've said for 13 years is that the cause of suffering is our wish to have reality be different than it actually is. And, you know, so he's really got that. And he says the reason he can be peaceful, and, you know, you, those of you who have experienced it have seen it, we really go into some deep stuff that's very powerful. And, and he's, he does it with big groups of people. You know, he's gone to, to Israel and worked with Holocaust survivors and and former Nazis, and you know, it's like, it just goes right into the depth of things. Um, so he's, he's saying very clearly his ability to be at peace is because of acceptance of things as they are. This one, just one more quick question here. This guy, someone says, it seems to me that you ask a great deal from the clients. You said yourself that you go to the outermost limit. And he says, together with the client, I survey the entire field of the consequences of his or her actions and fate. I don't limit it to what's easy and pleasant. I go with clients to the limits of their system, to the boundaries where their systems stop. And in fact, that means we eventually meet death. And with them, I look at the possibility that they will die, or that something terrible will happen. 
I accompany them, I go with them to the outer limits without fear, without hesitation. That's really true. And I've seen Margot do this over and over and over. And it's like, where regular therapists fear to tread, you know, they, she doesn't and he doesn't. It's like, straight at it. 